Hi, Danielle. Thank you so much for coming on to speak about uh, your research. You're welcome, Dave. It's great to be here and lots of exciting stuff to talk about. Exactly. Um, so in episode eight, we see a lot of, uh, we see mammals going through a lot of uh, changing environments. So have the last uh, two million years, which is the, the scope of episode eight, have they been particularly unstable? In terms of sort of overall climatic stability, we've been on a long-term downward trend towards increasingly cool and open environments. And that's something that started 23 million years ago. So what we see over the last 2 million years is really the sort of final flourish of, uh, of that long-term trend. Um, if you look at the early part of that period, so from about 2 million years to 1 million years, it's actually overall warmer and more... Uh, I would say muted climatic um, sort of fluctuations or wiggles, if you like. Mm. But certainly in Britain, for example, we get the last relics of what had been an almost tropical fauna with things like red pandas and tapirs. But then after a million years, things change and we swing into a different kind of system where we start to see the buildup of big glaciations uh, in the Northern Hemisphere in particular. And obviously, um, certainly for North America and Northwest Europe, where we're close to the Atlantic, we really feel the significance of those climate changes. Um, it wasn't always cold. So we, we enter a period where roughly every 100,000 years, we go into a major ice age. And then we climb out of that and have briefer periods of warm climate intervals, which are known as interglacials. Um, some of those were as warm as today. Some of them were even warmer. So there has been a lot of change for our mammals to cope with. Wow. So uh, I think it is really important to show that the the glaciations are up and down, up and down. What what causes their periodicity? So that's caused by Earth's orbit around the sun. So these are what are referred to as Milankovitch cycles, and there are several factors that drive the build up of ice, uh, particularly in the high latitudes. Um, but yes, from about a million years, we're looking at roughly every 100,000 years. So when people talk about the ice age, actually there were many ice ages going back through time to a million years. Mm, so is it like on average colder then? Yes, yes, for sure. So the warm periods were very short, um, roughly about 10,000 years in length. And it's interesting because we've had our 10,000 years in the Holocene, the current warm stage that we're in now. So um, overall, yes, most of the time we would have been either coming into or going out of an ice age. Okay. And is, is that the case for all ice ages? Because there's other ice ages that we talk about in this series. So like going back to the Ordovician, I think it was, would that still have the same like periodicity, like 100,000 years? Wobble. No, those would have been different periodicities. So we're able to establish what's going on very clearly over, say, the last two to two and a half million years. Okay, so how did uh, mammals adapt to um, these cold environments in general? So from about two and a half million years ago, we start to see some of the characters appearing that we will recognise, um, and indeed some of the ones that are, are sort of archetypal, characteristic Ice Age beasts but also some of the ones that we see that are adapted to uh, polar or high latitude environments today. Um, so the kinds of things that we might um, look at in terms of uh, cold adaptations, I'm thinking about things like woolly mammoths and woolly rhinos. Obviously these were large bodied animals, which helps them to retain heat. Um, and things like mammoths, for example, had other features. So for example, things like small ears, and a small tail, which are also advantageous in conserving heat. And also, of course, they've got a big woolly coat. They would have had um, a very sort of complex coat structure, actually, with a finer underwall close to the body, which would have helped keep them warm. But actually, over the top of that, longer guard hairs, which would have hung down almost like a sort of skirt that you see on musk ox today. And those hairs have actually been analyzed, so we can still see hairs preserved in the permafrost, for example. And they have like a hollow fiber structure, which would have helped retain warmth, 
but also made them very springy and tangle free. So actually, they they were able to to develop these coats that also helped them uh, help to protect them from the cold. Um, other things like reindeer, which um, we we see evolving um, and obviously carrying on at the present day. So those also have cold adaptations. So they've got very blunt uh, muzzles, which help uh, with the warming of air, cold air as it comes into the lungs. They've got stocky bodies. Um, their hooves splay nicely to help them walk on the snow. Again, they've got like a hollow fiber coat as well. And they can also do interesting things like um, adjusting their blood circulation so that they keep the core areas of the body and the brain warm, but they allow um, the parts of the body, such as the, the lower limbs, the feet that are in contact with the cold ground, they, they can operate at cooler temperatures. So they're not wasting all their energy in warming parts of the body that are co close to the cold ground. Mm. So lots of different adaptations, both in carnivores and herbivores to these cold environments. Okay, so say we've got a because um, the the range of these mammals was was longer than the the periodicity of um, these Milankovitch cycles, uh, the glaciations and deglaciations. So we've got a, a cold adapted uh, mammoth, for instance, is massive, it's very well set up for dealing with the cold. But then we hit a interglacial period. <laughs> Wouldn't it be a, a severe disadvantage being, you know, like in an environment that's warmer than today? Did they? Are you able to trace like the the paleo biogeography of these cold adapted animals during these deglaciations? Did they just have to chase the cold as it as it like became more restricted to the poles? Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what they do. So the story of this part of Earth's history for our mammals is really one of move, adapt or die. And at certain points in time, all of those things have happened. But essentially for cold adapted species, they will shift their range and they would retreat to the north, to the east, back into Siberia, for example, where they would be able to survive in these areas. It's important to emphasize, though, that although we think of woolly mammoths as exclusively cold adapted uh, species, um, more archaic or ancestral mammoths were actually also at home during some of our um, sort of cooler but more open interglacials. So actually, as long as it was sort of open, suitable vegetation for them and not too hot, they were able to survive in those environments as well. But there are, of course, some others that are obligate cold species. And we can trace the movement of these animals through their fossil records. So we're able to see them moving in and out of certain areas. Um, and certainly some of the work that I do on cave sites in the southwest of Britain, we can see even very small mammals such as lemmings and tundra adapted voles moving their range from Siberia, from Scandinavia, from around the North Pole and coming into Britain when climates deteriorated and then retreating away as it gets warmer. Wow, that's that's incredible. Like because you know, I I research um, stuff in the Paleozoic, so we're back in the Ordovician Silurian, and you know, you just lose millions and millions of years between specimens and between uh, fossil sites. But here, you can trace something uh, on such a short scale and look at something so intricately. I'm incredibly jealous. <laughs> it's, it's one of the advantages of working on more recent part of Earth's history, because actually the fossil record, it's not complete by any means. But also, you know, in the last 50,000 years, we're able to use techniques such as radiocarbon dating, and those have errors of plus or minus 40 years. And even I find that astonishing that we can date something so precisely. And it really helps us with understanding how these species have responded to very abrupt and long-term climate. In 40 years, that's like, what, what's a generation for elephants? Is it? Well, I mean, longer than that, because I mean, this is one of the reasons why actually the elephant family, including mammoths, have been vulnerable, um, because obviously they, they take a long time to mature. They, uh, they'll live to about 60 years in the wild, um, but yes, they, they are slow 
to mature. They don't have many calves. Um, so actually, yes, you're within a generation of a single animal with that level of resolution. It's quite extraordinary. And the other thing I'm jealous of is the fact that you have um, complete specimens uh, preserved in the permafrost. Like, yeah, so, how, <laughs> how perfectly preserved are they? So many of them are extraordinarily preserved. And of course, the fossil record is incomplete because um, all sorts of things happen to animals when they die. They get pulled apart by scavengers. Their bones get weathered and broken up and trampled, for example. But in the permafrost in Siberia and also in Alaska, there are these extraordinary one-offs, really, where you get single individuals that are preserved. And that is incredible because not only can we see what these animals look like rather than just, I suppose, bring them back to life through looking at, uh, at the bones and the teeth, for example. So we get a sense of appearance. Uh, we can look at things like their stomach contents. Um, Mammoths, for example, uh, they even we can even examine their blood and see that it has a form of antifreeze in it as well. Wow. So there's an astonishing level of detail that we can get out of these permafrost preserved specimens. But of course, they're not the norm. Most of the time we find our fossils in ancient river gravels, in caves, for example, lots of different types of depositional environments. And they, they all give us different kinds of information that we can play with. Okay, well... The last ice age we see ending with um, the the collapse of this ice wall holding back a, a giant freshwater lake. So we see that uh, it obviously wasn't very good for the life that was in the path of this flood. But I wanted to talk more about what the implications of that event was and, and how it affected life um, wider than just what was in front of the floodwaters? So I think we can probably envisage the, the end of the last ice age as a series of sort of catastrophic events. You've just mentioned the, the overflow from, from Lake Agassiz, but um, it depends very much where you are in the world as to how quickly the ice age comes to an end. So in those areas of North America, Climate doesn't really start to warm up until about 8,000 years ago, whereas certainly in Europe, in New Zealand, for example, we see warming happen much more rapidly. So again, we need to sort of be aware that there are different trends going on in different parts of the world. And of course, I mean, for those animals that had been cold adapted um, and had been able to survive in the sort of mid latitudes during the ice age, they will already have been under a lot of ecological stress. And that's because when we think about the last ice age, it's not uniformly cold conditions. Um, there was a lot of climatic variability. We know this because we can sink cores into the ice sheets in Greenland, for example, and see an astonishing record of climatic variation. So for example, the period between about 60 and 25,000 years ago, the climate goes through very abrupt, um, cold and warm cycles, um, you know, every one to 2000 years, really. And again, you imagine what kind of stress this would have put under, put our large fauna in particular under. They would have had to have shifted their range, their habitats would have become fragmented. It might have become harder to find mates, to find food resources, for example. So, there's already been a lot of climatic disruption running up to the end of the Ice Age, which has affected our mammals. But also, a lot of them have been thriving in these Ice Age environments. And again, sometimes people have like a, a sort of rather, I guess, outdated picture of things like mammoths sort of standing alone on a, an ice sheet with not a blade of grass in sight. In fact, those environments, those Ice Age environments could not have been more different they were super productive. This is the landscape of the mammoth steppe, as it's known, these wide open expanses of grassland that were patrolled by huge herds of megafauna. So mammoths, woolly rhinos, horses, reindeer, bison, uh, giant deer, and of course, associated predators and early humans eventually as well. And of course, those environments also start to break up as well. Those animal communities start to break up. 
as we move into the Holocene, the current warm stage, and not only do we see climatic warming, but we also see the spread of forest as well. And that's going to have an important effect on supporting some animals that are adapted to these more closed environments, but affecting others that actually thrived in these open sort of northern savanna-like habitats. So the scene that we see, it's all very snowy. Uh, would you have liked to have seen that just like really green open grasslands? Yes, I think to my mind, that would be a really good reconstruction. Now, of course, snow would fall during the winter periods. But when you think about the sheer number of herbivores that are out there, this extinct ecosystem, the mammoth steppe, has to provide enough forage for all of them. And in fact, for a lot of the grazing mega herbivores, the more you graze, the more you promote the grass to grow. There's also a lot of dung on the landscape as well. So that's also helping to provide this very fertile environment. And you would have just seen, um, you know, particularly in these, these mid to high latitudes, these huge expanses of open grassland that were patrolled by massive herds of mammoths, woolly rhinos, horses, bison, reindeer. And of course, that in turn facilitates the presence of carnivores, things like spotted hyenas and cave lions that would have been hunting them, and early humans as well. So it was a very rich and productive, rather dry environment, but the grazing activity of those animals themselves is keeping any tree growth down and actually promoting um, the production of, of grasses and, and low growing herbs as well. So they were very fertile environments. Here is uh, a thought that I've just had. So we're, we're looking at the changing environments and how that affects the, uh, the mega herbivores. But after the extinction, after their extinction, uh, did that have an impact on the environment? because they weren't there grazing, they weren't there leaving dung. Yeah, so this is one of the things that we are only really in recent years starting to get to grips with, and that's the role of these extinct mega herbivores. And many of them were keystone species, just as we would see with mega herbivores in, say, Africa today, um, where they're sort of, they are the movers and shapers of the ecosystems. So um, the the the, the larger species would be um, opening up the vegetation to allow um, light in, to allow more uh, sort of smaller species to come in and graze. You've got, um, you know, different guilds of these, uh, these herbivores. So they're all performing slightly different roles in the ecosystem. So facilitating, often facilitating uh, grazing opportunities for others. But they also do important things. I mean, you've mentioned dung. That's a very important thing. But also the transportation of seeds, for example, um, the churning up of the landscape as they walk over it. So that's also um, sort of promoting a good seed bed for growth of plants and enhancing biodiversity. So there's lots of ways that these megafaunal species influenced the environment in a very positive way previously. And obviously their disappearance brought all that to a close. So the thing that we've not spoken about and, and that we see in the documentary is um, humans and their hunting, their predation having an impact. Uh, but relative to the climate, which, which was having more of an impact? Uh, that's a really hotly debated question when it comes to extinction of the megafauna in particular. And you've got to remember really that there were species around such as Neanderthals that were around for more than 250,000 years and to our knowledge never brought a single species to extinction. Whereas once our species appears all over Europe from about 40,000 years ago and then begins to spread all over the globe, we've got situations where you've already got the megafauna under ecological stress for the, the climate transitions that I, I explained previously. And I think probably human hunting was the final nail in the coffin, um, certainly for the Pleistocene or Ice Age megafauna. Of course, humans are totally responsible for the extinction of other species, for example, on islands uh, in the Pacific, for example, we know that uh, when the later people get into a territory, the more devastating they are, whether it's them or whether it's bringing invasive species such as cats, rats, and so on. Um, so human hunting, important, certainly, 
Um, but it's difficult for us to find evidence of smoking guns and for whole herds of animals to be obliterated. Um, and certainly, for example, things like the, the mammoth bone hut circles on uh, the Eastern European and Russian steppes, those were analyzed with a more critical eye several decades ago. And it was realized that these, these bones, uh, you know, which have been accumulated from mammoth carcasses that have been out on the plains, um, it doesn't represent a single hunting episode. Um, this is material that was picked up over many, many years and used to make, um, to make hut circles, um, and it, largely because there, was, there were no trees, there was no building material around. So some of the things that we had thought were evidence for really sort of impactful human hunting in the past, we can now dismiss, but you can't get over the fact that obviously humans are hunting these megafaunal species, even as they're becoming rare in the environment. And eventually that, that would have been the final nail in the coffin. Um, how could you tell if uh, a human had killed a, a, a mammoth, for instance, as opposed to just come across a, a carcass that had died and used the bones there? Yeah, that's also a very good question. Um, and so this is where taphonomy comes in. So this is the study of the origins of bone assemblages and trying to understand whether humans have played a role in accumulating those carcasses. And there are things that you, you need to look at. I mean, obviously, if they just found a carcass, um, you know, dead through natural causes, for example, um, there wouldn't be any evidence for uh, stone projectiles, for example, embedded in the ribs, in the spine, so there wouldn't be any evidence for hunting. Um, it's, it's actually very scant anyway. Um, similarly, if they had come across a carcass um, that had been killed by a carnivore, it's actually quite hard to chase a carnivore off a carcass, but it might potentially have been possible. But there, the carnivores would have had access to the meat first. And so if you find the gnaw marks of carnivores on the bones underlying cut marks by humans, you know that the carnivores got there first. If it's the other way around, that there are human cut marks on the bones from flint tools, and those are overlain by later carnivore gnawing marks, you know that the carnivores got in there and scavenged a carcass. So there's all kinds of little clues that we need to look for to give us a timeline, essentially on who got there first, who was, who was the agent of accumulation. I absolutely love the, the details that you can get out of this. And, and I mean, in general as well, I didn't know about any uh, bone huts that have been found. Uh, were they, you know, like just the, the remnants of them? What, what state were they in when they were found? So that they're actually quite complete looking. They're very impressive. Uh, there's a bunch of them um, sort of ranging from the Czech Republic through, I've seen some lovely ones in Ukraine, for example. And... Um, they are. They would have probably had skins stretched across the top to make the roof, but mammoth bones, uh, jaws, they were all piled up very carefully to make essentially the base for the hut. And so they exist in these sort of large circular formations. And you can see these bones stacked up to make the, the lower parts of the walls. Really impressive. I'm just having a Google. <laughs> yeah, wow. They're quite cool, aren't they? I like, I like the fancy entrance. Yes, yeah. I mean, obviously, that you know, we see them with with sort of reconstructions, but it's you know, you can actually see the bones in the ground stacked up. So it's pretty, it's pretty impressive when you see that. And yeah, they, they were used as building materials. But you can imagine how when people first found them, it was like, oh my goodness, this is a whole herd of mammoths wiped out. But actually, by radiocarbon dating the bones. And actually looking at the state of preservation, you see that there are differences. They're actually accumulated over long periods of time. Whoa, that's awesome. Sorry, I, I'm just... Um, it, me as a paleontologist that doesn't get this far up ever, I'm having quite a time <laughs> looking at this. Wow. Okay, 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 okay. And I mean, the audience should definitely Google that as well. I, I, they they are great, honestly, and it's actually quite rare for us to find evidence of huts, um, even made by early modern humans. So, 
we have a lot of things in the form of stone tools. Occasionally we get butchered bones. But actually seeing an encampment like that, I think it really brings it to life. So as these megafauna are going extinct, do we see any any patterns as, as to which of those animals are more likely to go extinct? Is it just the bigger that you are, the more susceptible you will be? Or does uh, does the extinctions and the climate variability like hit animals across the board? It's very much on an individual trajectory. And that's something that we've also come to understand in recent years of work on this. Um, it's not a single cause. Uh, it doesn't happen at the same time across the globe. So we have to look at these species individually. As a general rule, the, the bigger you are and the more specialized you are, the more vulnerable you are. So there are some fundamental things um, with, uh, you know, obviously with, with, with species today. So we have species that, uh, you know, we have these, these K-selected and R-selected species, depending on how they, um, uh, they reproduce, how often they reproduce, what kind of parental care they give to their, um, their offspring. And something like an elephant, um, as, as you know, we, we can see today very clearly, they are slow to mature. They only have, say, one calf, and then it takes several years after a long gestation period before they'll have another calf. So if anything happens to them, it's difficult for them to make up their numbers. Um, whereas you could contrast that with something like a, a mouse or a vole, which is obviously able to to bring its numbers back up very, very quickly if there's some kind of environmental perturbation. So the larger you are, that can be um, that can be a disadvantage, of course. Um, but again, it depends. There are some species that were certainly um, also affected by uh, the growth of forest during um, the very terminal phases of the last ice age. So for example, things like cave lions, they were predominantly open ground species. And there are periods right at the end of the last ice age where the climate is very unstable. And we have periods of brief warmth uh, where there was increasing um, forest growth and that appears to negatively affect them. Whereas other species are certainly affected by increasing cold. Uh, the coldest part of the last ice age was around about sort of 20,000 years ago. And certainly many species, even the cold adapted ones, would have been very much affected by this. Are there any lessons from the last two million years that we can apply to climatic events today? So certainly in terms of climate, we can see obviously how abruptly climate can change. We can see periods where there is enhanced warmth compared to today. And I think that gives us a useful window into looking at what the environment, what the flora, what the fauna was like then. So that can help us to predict what it might look like under warming conditions today. But also just in terms of the way that it affected animal communities, again, I think there are lessons to be learned. So when we think about conservation today, we often have quite a short-term perspective, and that's purely because ecological records don't go back you know, more than a few decades, 100 years, if you're lucky. Here, with our paleoecological records, we can go back thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. And that helps give us a more accurate baseline. During times when there was no evidence for human impact on the climate, on the environment, it helps give us a more accurate picture of where animals should be distributed, what kinds of food they were foraging for, what kind of prey, uh, how they coexisted with competitors. So there are certainly lessons to be learned from the past in terms of what we would now call sort of conservation paleobiology, using the evidence from the past to help us make better decisions um, for the future in terms of conser conserving species, especially those that are vulnerable or endangered. Um, a nice example of this, certainly from Britain, would be something like a wildcat. So it's our most endangered British carnivore today. They live up in Scotland, up in the Highlands, in moorland, upland environments, and they're really struggling. And that's because they haven't retreated to an environment that is the most suitable for them. 
they have retreated to a place which is the only way, only place that they can survive without persecution. But if you look back in the recent record and in the recent fossil record, you'll see that they are naturally creatures of deciduous woodlands. And so in order to, well, to save these species in future, we may have to think about translocating them down to areas that are actually more suitable and where they've always inhabited in the past. Um, the challenge there is that actually we, we have a lot of domestic cats, so there's issues to do with interbreeding and disease transmission. But this is where evidence from the past can be really important for us. Okay. Is it important that we do try and save species and manage environments in this way? I think we have an obligation to look after what we have and for those species that we have clearly affected, which is pretty much everything. So I think we could and should intervene where necessary. And I think as far as managing environments go, we're, we're very, we like to, to sort of, we do like to interfere with environments as well. And even when we're trying to conserve things, in actual fact, a nature-led approach is best. Mm. Um, so, for example, if we think about the reintroduction of species and how to manage grasslands and promote biodiversity, it's quite clear that bringing back some of our herbivores, mm. things like bison, uh, wild horses, wild boar, elk, these could all come back uh, to many areas very easily in the same way that there are lots of beavers around that are also doing great work, uh, for example, with managing in a natural, completely cost-free way, managing areas that are prone to flooding. We can bring these herbivores back and actually they could be really useful in terms of naturally managing these ecosystems and um, enhancing biodiversity in that way. So could it ever be possible that we re-engineer an environment similar to, you know, the mammoth steps? Yes, I think in parts of the world where the mammoth step could still survive today, and it would have to be, for example, in the far north and east um, of Eurasia, for example, because we're in an interglacial, so that's where it, it would be restricted to today. But yes, I think we could easily engineer those kinds of environments by bringing back the species that we had around. Of course, things like mammoths are long gone, but things like bison, muskox, um, many of these species would have a really positive effect on the grazing regime and enhanced biodiversity. It also has knock-on effects for other groups that we, you know, we might not think about, for example. So in the past, the dung beetle fauna was incredibly rich and diverse because you had all these herbivores that were around. And that's a group that has really suffered since the megafauna has disappeared. So again, there would be all sorts of, of, of positive feedbacks for other groups as well. Well, Danielle, it's been brilliant hearing about all of this work. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on.